So let's get started. Today's material is uh, the DFT, which is my favorite transform. Who knows why it's my favorite transform? Because it's useful. Um, so you can do stuff on computers with representations of signals because it's finite in both time and frequency. And we'll see some cool repercussions of that. Um, but before I get going, uh, just a reminder, your homework is due tonight before midnight. Uh, please submit that on BSpace. Not BSpace, B courses. All right, so when we have discrete signals, that is to say we sample a continuous signal, sometimes weird things happen. So who can tell me what's going on in this picture? Aliasing, right? So because we lost information about the picture, we have these crazy waves that are showing up on the, on the image itself. And as, yeah, some of you may have seen this when you compress a JPEG too far, you, you often get this. So you're throwing away too much information. And um, so there's a really cool example of aliasing called the rolling shutter effect. Okay, so what do you think's going on here? <laughs> All right, someone guessed aliasing. <laughs> is, it, is anyone familiar with the guts of how a camera works? Yeah, so most cameras... <laughs> okay, well, he sounded really confident, so I think he knows what he's talking about. <laughs> um, so most cameras on the market today have a rolling shutter, which means instead of taking in an entire image all at once, it'll first, it'll first sense one part of the image, and then the next part of the image, and then the next. So it's kind of scanning the image instead of just capturing it globally. So what's happening is by the time, oh, let me, there. So we have a nice like wiggly uh, time here. And so by the time the scanner gets down to the bottom of this, the time has moved a little bit. And so when we display the picture, it, it looks like it's wiggly, even though these are really stiff uh, pieces of metal. Uh, and so this is a nice example of how aliasing can give you some really trippy effects when you process your signals. Um, and we will talk more about that in a little bit. Oh, it's aliasing because you're not capturing the entire um, you're not capturing the entire spectrum at a single instant in time. So because of your sampled representation, uh, you're getting weird effects that are not representative of what the sample of what the signal actually looks like. Okay. So, right. So we mentioned this a little bit earlier. But if you want to do any kind of Fourier analysis, any kind of uh, frequency domain analysis on a computer or in any kind of hardware, um, you have to have a discrete representation, right? We can't represent anything continuous on discrete hardware. Or, okay, so I guess technically our transistors are analog, but we treat them as discrete. Um, so, right. But sampling, so sampling in one domain corresponds to periodicity in the other. So what does that mean for the DFT if we're sampling in both frequency and time? What's that? Yeah, so it, it implies that you have some periodicity in both domains. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit later about how um, how we deal with that in practice by convention. So what, what about the discrete Fourier series? Who remembers the DFS? Nobody, that's good. <laughs> uh, seriously though, have you guys encountered the Fourier series? Okay, you just don't remember it. Okay, great. Um, so we'll talk about the discrete Fourier series today and how it relates to the DFT. Um, okay, and what if, what if the input signal, what if the signal that I'm trying to capture or represent on my computer is not periodic? We cut it, right? 
So this is one of the many approximations that we make as engineers. We say, okay, this signal, I'm going to take just a finite chunk of it, pretend that it's periodic, and then use the tools that I've developed for periodic signals. So we often treat our signals as being finite, even if maybe they're not, or treat them as periodic, even if maybe they're not. So just to give you a little chart um, to understand what, uh, what transform to use when, let's, uh, let's fill this in together. So this is, this is for a time domain signal. If I have a time domain signal that is periodic and discrete, what transform do you think is best suited for that? DFS, right? How about aperiodic and discrete? DTFT, we talked about this on Monday. Um, okay, how about periodic and continuous? CFS, right? So you can, you can use the CTFT, but it reduces to the CFS. The CFS is a simpler representation. Um, aperiodic and continuous? DTFT. Okay, where does the DFT fit into this? Yes, but also we sometimes we use the D DFT sometimes on aperiodic signals, and we just truncate it and say, okay, we're going to use these endpoints and compute a DFT on that. So it's kind of a, a funny question. Um, so the DTFT can use be used over input signals of either type, but in our mental approximation, we just treat it as a finite signal. So yeah, the rest, the rest of these boxes are treated as infinite. Okay, so the nice thing, one of the many nice things about the DFT, and the reason it's become so widespread in basically all of the electronics that we have today, all of your phones have implementations of DFST, is that we have efficient implementations of these algorithms. So, um, for instance, if you were to directly evaluate the DFT uh, the, or compute the DFT of a signal, it would be O of n squared, where n is the number of points that you're considering in your DFT. Right? Um, but the fast Fourier transform, the FFT, uh, allows us to do this in O of n log n complexity. So have you guys learned about how the FFT works? Yeah, okay, great. Um, I, I'm not sure if they'll talk about it more later in the semester, but it's pretty cool. Um, oh, yeah, I guess, <laughs> I guess this green note would indicate that we will talk about it. <laughs> um, okay, and there are efficient libraries that may come useful to you in your labs and homework. Um, so you can just refer to the, the slides later if you need to compute FFTs in Python. Uh, and similarly, convolution can be done really efficiently. So instead of computing the convolution directly by using flip and drag, right, we can do this in the frequency domain using the FFT. So again, we get O of n log n. So these are kind of nice, very low level practical reasons for why the DFT is so widespread. So, okay, so moving forward, um, I'm going to use X tilde to represent a periodic signal and X to represent a, an aperiodic signal or, yeah, just a regular signal. So, um, all right, so we're, we're, and we're going to assume that X tilde is periodic with period big N. So we have the usual condition, X tilde of N plus big N is just X tilde of N. And similarly, what this means in the frequency domain is that it is also periodic with the same period. Right? Um, by the way, I, if any of this is not clear or if you don't remember this from learning about the DFT previously, please let me know. Um, but yeah, it's clear that an endpoint signal maps to an endpoint DFT, right? Okay. All right, so how do we compute the discrete Fourier series? We're, we're gonna start with that and then show how it's different from the DFT. So to find the discrete Fourier series, we start with a kernel. Our kernel is W sub n. And it's just a complex number that's kind of the, the basic number that we use to construct our transformation. So W sub n is e to the minus j 2 pi over n. 
And some of you may have um, seen this presented slightly different, or with different terminology, rather, where um, we just consider the fu quote unquote fundamental frequency, um, where that is omega naught, which is just 2 pi over n. And what this fundamental frequency represents is the step size in the frequency domain. So if I have an endpoint signal, then in the frequency domain, I'll have endpoints, each of which are spaced by 2 pi over n radians per second. Does that make sense? Um, okay. So we're going to use this kernel notation. I think that's what Mickey prefers. Um, so I just wanted to point out the other one in case that's how you or that's how you're familiar with it. So the way we define the discrete Fourier series, we compute the k coefficient of the, our periodic signal by summing over one period, exactly one period, and multiplying it by our kernel raised to the k raised to the n. So what what does it mean to raise this kernel to a power in terms of this in terms of this idea of fundamental frequency? Yeah, so you're you're adding you're scaling your frequency. So if our If our omega n were to look like this, and this is omega, then multiplying omega n squared is just going to double this frequency, right? So this is omega n squared. So when it says here in this summation that we're multiplying the elements of our signal by increasing powers of our kernel, it's like we're projecting onto onto an eigenfunction of a particular frequency. And that, and that frequency is omega n, or 2 pi k over n. Okay, so I'll show you a picture of this. I, I know that was very hand wavy. Um, okay, so our kernel has a few important properties. Um, the first is that when you, omega n to the zero is, or omega n is periodic when you raise it to powers that are multiples of n. So omega n to the 0 equals omega n to the n equals omega n to the 2n equals 1, right? So the first term in this summation, when n equals 0, is always going, this term is always going to be 1, okay? And um, yeah, so the similar, so this just indicates that uh, it's periodic in n, if you, if you raise this to powers of n plus a constant. Um, and yeah, the basic rules of multiplying exponentials hold. So to step through an example here, let's say that big N equals 6. So we know that when we raise um, Wn to the 0 power, we get out 1, right? So this is the complex plane. Now when we raise it to the first power, it moves here. Why does it move down instead of up? Can you say that louder? Minus right, because our, our w sub n is e to the minus j 2 pi over n. Right? So when, when we raise it to powers, it's going to start moving uh, clockwise. So, yeah, we raise it to different powers, and then once we reach a multiple of, of 6, then we're back to 1 again. Okay, so that was like, that was like this term when k equals 1. Right? Now let's evaluate this term when k equals 2. So, again, we start at 1 here. Does that make sense? Okay, so then when we raise omega n squared to the one power, we get double the frequency counterclockwise. And then we, uh, we raise that to the second power, we move th that same frequency again. And so we're moving again clockwise, but this time we're moving faster. Okay, 
So what happens when k equals 2? So when k equals 1, we move from here to here. When k equals 2, we move from here to here. What happens when k, oh, sorry. What happens when k equals 3? Right, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1. So if we increase k even more, is the frequency going to go up or down? Down, right? Because um, e to the minus j pi n, or oscillating back and forth in every time step, is the fastest frequency that we can have in discrete time. Okay, and then, of course, the, the inverse formula looks a lot like the inverse DTFT, inverse D transform. Just we normalize by n now. And we these terms, these Wn to the Kn, are complex conjugated. All right. Now, the DFT. So in the DFS, we assume that our underlying discrete signal is periodic. The difference between the DFS and the DFT is kind of subtle. So the formulas look exactly the same. So between n equals 0 and n minus 1, they're going to look identical. The difference arises when you move outside that range. And so this is, I mean, this is a point that people don't entirely agree on. So in some books, you'll see that even for the DFT, they assume a periodic signal outside the range 0 to n minus 1. Some people say it's undefined. Um, but for this class, and I, th I, think most, I think most people do treat it as if it were 0 padded outside that range. Um, so yeah, they're very close rel closely related, but um, yeah, with a small difference. Okay. Oh, and in case you don't quite remember this, um, this is called, or the forward equation where you take an input from the signal domain and pass it to the frequency domain is called the analysis equation, and the reverse is called the synthesis equation. So sometimes you'll hear them referred to as such. So what is the DFS? DFS? Oh, okay. So the, they are, okay. They are the same in the sense that to compute the DFT or the DFS, you look at, a s at the input signal from 0 to n minus 1 and you compute these equations exactly like we discussed here or as, as we've written here. They are different in that if I give you the DFT or the if I give you the DFT of a signal, an endpoint DFT, and I ask you to find the signal domain representation of that signal, what you would do is compute this, the inverse DFT equation, the synthesis equation, for the points between 0 and n minus 1. But for everything else, you're going to set that to 0. Does that make sense? So and what, what would you do if it were a DFS? You would draw it as periodic. Right. So that's the, that's the only real difference. Um, there's also an alternative formulation in the book, not in the book, um, and that has you scale each equation by 1 over square root of n instead of putting just 1 over n on the inverse DFT. Why do you think that's useful? You don't have to remember which one has 1 over n. All right, he said <laughs> so you don't have to remember which one has 1 over n. Uh, okay, I'll take it. <laughs> Any, anyone else? No. All right, so then you can use the same exact algorithm to calculate both. Um, almost, right? So the inverse, D, uh, inverse DFT still has the complex conjugate uh, uh, multiplication or projection, but you're very close. So, and we'll actually see later how you can use um, the DFT to compute the inverse DFT. Yeah. Yeah, it makes the transform symmetric. So 
in the previous case, in the previous formulation, we'll see in a little bit that you can frame the DFT as multiplying your finite signal by a matrix. So in the previous formulation, the, ma the DFT matrix and the inverse DFT matrix are orthogonal. Who remembers what an orthogonal matrix is? Yeah? Um, the transpose is not necessarily equal to the inverse, but you're on the right track. So in an orthogonal matrix, if you take the inner product of any two columns that are different, they're going to be, that's going to give you zero. And what this gives you is that your matrix is still orthogonal, but additionally it's orthonormal. So what do you think that means? Worth the same. Yeah, right. Okay. So in, so in addition to um, having the product, the inner product of any two non-equal uh, columns or rows being um, being zero. If you take the inner product of any column with itself, it's one. So basically, if you take your matrix transpose times your actual matrix, you get off the identity. And so this has some nice properties in terms of having the same energy, like conserving energy, having the same norm in both domains. Okay, I think, I think this is Mickey's preferred form, but in the book it has the other one, so I, either one is fine as long as you're clear about wh what you're doing. Okay, so here's a pictorial representation of what the, what the difference is between the DFS and the DFT. So, all right, so in the DFS, we are assuming here that our input signal is periodic. And similarly, we are assuming that the frequency domain representation is also periodic. Whereas in the DFT, as we've said a few times now, um, we're assuming that the entire signal outside of 0 and n minus 1 is 0. And the, the same with the, the DFT. And so these are, these are kind of small differences. They don't really affect the math in, in any way um, until you start thinking about, OK, what if I take a bigger window? So, right. OK, so are there any questions so far? We'll get to that. So glad you asked. <laughs> um, OK, so let's, well, let's work out an example. So I want to find the DFT of this signal. I'm going to take a five-point DFT. Right. So I'm going to write out the equation that we saw earlier. And because the signal is 1 from 0 to 4, that we just get this kernel to the nk. So it claims here that this result is 5 delta k. Is that obvious? OK, it's obvious to one of you. How many of you think it's not obvious? All right, let's work it out. OK, so when, any, when k equals 0, let's, let's figure out what this summation is. What is w sub 5 to the n0? One, right? So if we sum this from n equals 0 to 4, what are we get getting? 5. OK, so at k equals 0, this is definitely going to be 5. Right? The, the slightly trickier part to see is why it should be 0 everywhere else. Does anyone have an idea of why that is? The other exponentials are orthogonal. Um, well, they're they're kind of they're just numbers. So, but when you um, when you take the inner product of the all ones vector, it, it it sums to zero. But let's let's work that out real fast, just so everyone's on the same page. So let's let's take k equals one. So what is w sub five here? e to the minus j times 2 pi over 5, right? OK, and we're summing this um, to these powers from 0 to 4. 
right? So we get a summation that looks like 1 plus e to the minus j 2 pi over 5 plus e to the minus j 2 pi times what? I heard 2 and 4. Well, OK, we know this is over 5. What's the constant? We're summing from 0 to 4, right? Oh, yeah, sorry. So there, there are dots in between here. This is the, sorry, this is the biggest term in our summation. So we have this sum of complex exponentials. We've seen this a bunch of times. What should, you, what should this trigger in your head? Geometric sum. And so we can use our usual geometric sum formula, which is 1 minus what? Minus j 2 pi over 5 times what? Times 5 <laughs> over something. Right? OK, well, well OK, to be, to be complete, e to the minus j 2 pi over 5. 2 pi over 5. OK, so what happens up here in the numerator? It's 0, right? Because these 5's cancel, and this is a 1. OK? So, and that same thing happens for all the other k's from 1 to 4. So that's why this is a, an impulse in frequency. OK. Now, what happens if we take n equals 10? Um, first of all, if we consider n equals 10, what, what does the DFS think our signal is going to look like? 10 point periodic. So, um, yeah, so we have basically these 10 points. One, two, three. Yeah, these 10 points get repeated forever. Whereas if we take the DFT, Yeah, it's just these 10 points. And if we had to draw the entire uh, line of ends, it would be zeros. OK, so this is just saying that the DFS is going to assume periodicity. And essentially, we, we can compute this DFT in the same way that we computed the previous one. And I think we're going to see, oh, OK, so it actually works it out. So again, here we end up with a summation of exponentials, but this time they don't cancel out, right? Because we're not summing all the way to uh, back to n again, or back to n minus 1. So what we end up with is the, the fraction of complex exponentials that you saw in your homework and in our lectures and discussion, um, which is what? Periodic sync, right? But it's not quite a periodic sync. What kind of periodic sync? This is sampled, right? It's discrete. So usually periodic sync refers to, in the continuous domain, we have, um, we have our periodic sync. Um, and, okay. and also, this is kind of weird because, oh, sorry. OK, I should not have said yes to periodic sync. <laughs> Okay, why should I not have said yes to periodic sync? Right, because in the DFT, we assume that everything outside our endpoint range is zero. So uh, we're not going to treat this as a periodic sync signal. So it's one sampled period of a periodic sync. All right. Um, all right, now let's, let's try computing the, the DTFT. The DTFT, we remember the same old equation that we saw on Monday. So what, what are the similarities between these two uh, summations? What corresponds to what, do you think? OK, so he said omega corresponds to 2 pi over n times k. So what does that mean intuitively? What happens is I increase, so this, OK, this omega is a continuous frequency, right? Whereas 2 pi k over n is, a, is going to be discrete 
jumps. Right? But what happens is I increase big N. Smaller and smaller step size, and I, I get closer and closer to this continuous uh, representation of frequency. So what does that tell you about the relation between the DFT and the DTFT? It's like sampling the DTFT. Right? So we can, we can think of this um, as, yeah, as sampling the DTFT at points 2 pi over n times k. Okay. All right, so let's, knowing this, let's revisit our moving average example. Um, so here we, we already computed uh, the, the DTFT of this moving average before. And we found that it was what kind of signal? I heard sampled, which is not right. <laughs> this is a periodic thing, yeah. Right. Um, and we'll, we'll try to make this, like usually it'll be clear for you. Like if you see an omega, it's usually continuous. If you see, um, if you see K, it's usually discrete. <laughs> but be careful about that. So in this plot, you can see the magnitude of OK, so the black line is the magnitude of the DTFT of this signal. And note that now it's from 0 to 2 pi instead of negative pi to pi, which is what we saw the other day. And the green, point, the green dots are our 5-point DFT. So this was 5 at 0 and 0 everywhere else. But as soon as we expanded to a 10-point DFT, now we get these internal points as well. Right? And so the larger we make n, the more densely our points are going to be sampling the DTFT. So um, just to be clear, it's not like you get more information by, um, by collecting a larger N DFT, because in either case, you're, you're, saying, you're assuming that five points are enough to represent your signal. And if that's your assumption, then this is the most information you can expect to get. It is an orthonormal transformation of your signal domain signal. Um, but if your goal is to try to represent the DTFT of your signal, then using larger n can help you get a finer representation. OK, okay. so right. Uh, yeah, one small practical note. So usually when we plot the DTFT, it's usually from minus pi to pi. And just by the definition, um, usually the DFT is going to give you from 0 to 2 pi. So be careful with that. You can use FFT shift function to switch, one, switch between the two. Um, yeah. And so that's why usually when you take the DFT of like a voice signal or some kind of real signal, you'll usually have a bunch of energy, and then it tapers down, and then it spikes up again at 2 pi, because most signals are low, low frequency. OK, so Mickey calls this a game. Um, we're going <laughs> to, all right. So we're going to figure out how to, comp actually, I'm not going to tell you what the goal is. Your, your job is to figure out what the goal is here. So when you multiply n by the complex conjugate of your signal, we can write out n times the usual DFT formula, oh, inverse inverse DFT formula, and take the complex conjugate of that. And so by the rules of complex conjugation, we know that uh, we just move the complex conjugate in and take the complex conjugate here and here, right? But what is this? This summation is just the DFT of the complex conjugate of the DFT of little x, little x. So we're taking two DFTs there. Um, another point is that it, it's possible to show, I'm not going to do it here, that n times x conjugate of n is equal to this expression. Right? OK, so we get out something. We can put those two pieces equal to each other, and we get this expression. Why is this useful? 
Yeah, great. Um, so this is really nice because we know that we have an efficient algorithm for taking the DFT of a signal, right? So it would be really great if we could also take the inverse DFT using that same efficient method, right? So what this is saying is that if I want to take the inverse DFT of my signal, all I have to do is first take the complex conjugate of my DFT, then I take another DFT of that, divide by n, and take another complex conjugate. Bam, I'm done. Right? So this is nice because we can use our FFT algorithm out of the box to compute inverse DFTs. And so, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, the DFT can be thought of as a matrix. Um, and so unlike the DTFT, this is now a finite matrix, an n by n matrix. And it is invertible, it's orthonormal, like we mentioned, so each of the columns is going to have norm one. And so we can compactly write the act of taking a DFT as <coughs> multiplying our signal by the DFT matrix. And similarly, by the property that we just talked about, if I want to find the time domain signal from the DFT, I just have to multiply by 1 over n and take the complex transpose of w. Um, so that's not quite captured there. This sh that should be a Hermitian. Um, but you're taking the complex conjugate and transposing the matrix. So, right. So here, if we write out x equals 1 over n times wn uh, star times the DFT of x, we can expand this using the above equation. And what is this equal to? Identity, right? Because it's an orthonormal matrix. So taking the complex transpose, complex conjugate transpose uh, gives you that. Um, oh, right, yeah. And there's also a factor of n in there <laughs> because you're, um, uh, because of the, the normalization issue. Okay, so the properties are pretty similar to the DFT, uh, DF, DFS, and similar to all the other properties that we've seen all week. Um, they're getting, yeah, so we have linearity, uh, we have time invariance, but time invariance is slightly different, or, uh, yeah, slightly different here. Um, because now we have to do circular time shifts instead of regular time shifts. So what does that mean? It means that if I take my signal and I want to shift it by 2, I'm going to move all my points over by 2, but these top two have to wrap around. Right? Um, and so here's an illustration of what a cir <coughs> circular shift looks like. Um, so in, in the DFS domain, in our periodic signal, if we were to shift it, we just move it over by m, just as you would expect. But in this case, if we want to shift by m, then we have to move the triangle so that it starts at m, and then move the remains back to the origin. So we have similar properties where a modulation in time domain is like a frequency shift, but now it's a circular shift, right, instead of um, just a regular shift. And Similarly, complex conjugation is uh, like taking the complex conjugate of your circularly flipped uh, frequency domain signal. Um, and, and we have conjugate symmetry again for real signals. Is that clear to everyone? Okay, so let's, let's see an example of conjugate symmetry for real symbols. I'll do a four-point example for you. Okay, are, you are you able to see over here? Yeah. Okay. Just want to make sure I'm not blocking anyone. Um, okay. So symmetry in the DFT is kind of funny because uh, we're, we're treating our, our signal as being, you know, just four points long, and it's only defined from zero to four. Right? 
So 0, 1, 2, 3, from 0 to 3. Um, so if I want to have the property of conjugate symmetry, I, want, I need a symmetric signal in the <coughs> signal domain. What should be symmetric with what? So I have my little x of, little x of n. What should x of 0 be symmetric with? I hear 4. Zero. 0. I hear 3. <laughs> All right. Why do, you think it's, why do you think it should be symmetric with 0? Is it, sorry, were you the one that said that? OK, so you said it, but you you're not sure why. No, I didn't say it. Oh, you didn't say it. Who said 0? Oh, OK, sorry. Uh, why do you think it should be symmetric with 0? Yeah, so we zero can think minus zero. zero does equal minus zero. <laughs> um, so if we think about this in the frequency domain, we know that our DFT is again going to have four points. What is this frequency going to be? It was that fundam sorry. Go. Yeah, so two pi over four. Right? 2 pi over n, or in this case, 2 pi over 4, which is pi over 2. Right? So let's say pi over 2. What's this one? Pi. And then 3 pi over 2. OK, so we know that we can think of this, if, if this were a DFS, this would be periodic with period 2 pi. Right, but sampled. Right, so here's 2 pi. That's not going to appear in our DFT. But this should be equal to that. Right? So 0 is kind of symmetric with itself. So 0 can be whatever it wants to be. What does this index correspond to? If we, if we were to do a direct mapping between these two, which is... Pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2 are, are, are corresponding. Um, so we want x of 1 to be symmetric with x of 3, or that they should have the same value. And how about x of 2? It's like pi, symmetric with itself. So, OK, so it's not entirely, it's not right to have a one to one correspondence between an index in the time domain and an index in the frequency domain. But this is, this is just a way for you to remember what should be symmetric with what. OK? Is that clear? All right. So now let's try it for a five-point DFT. So I'm going to erase this. Four. OK. Now, what should 0 be symmetric with? 0, again. How about 1? One? 1 and 4. So we'll say 1 and 4 are the same. And 2 and 3 are going to be the same. So if this type of symmetry holds, um, so yeah, another way of thinking about it is if you wrap it. So if you wrap it, it's symmetric about 0. Um, then, uh, then you'll have complex conjugate symmetry. In the in the Fourier domain, yeah. Is this Fourier domain or? Uh, signal? Sorry, this is signal domain, right? So these are what I'm talking about now is conditions on the signal in signal domain, such that you'll have um, complex conjugate symmetry in the Fourier domain. All right. So one of the many reasons why uh, the DFT is cool is because it lets you do really fun things with your signals that have actually had really big economic uh, impact. Um, who knows who this is? It's T-Pain. <laughs> um, so right, have all of you heard auto? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> all right, this was a poor choice. Um, 
Okay, so. Okay, so this guy's gonna be singing with and without something called a phase vocoder. Okay, so this is objectively horrible. <laughs> and what you can do is actually take the DFT, a time representation of the DFT called a spectrogram, and change the frequency information so that you're actually hitting different notes than you were hitting originally. Okay, so this guy all of a sudden, he sounds like a robot, but he's hitting the right notes, right? <laughs> and so this is a problem called phase vocoder, and it was open for a long time. It was really, people didn't understand how to do it. And the problem is that if you look at a spectrogram, who, who's never seen a spectrogram before? Okay, great. So you all know how to read this? Um, so what would you do if you wanted to change the pitch? Like this is a spectrogram of a violin, someone playing one note on a violin. What would you do if you wanted to change the pitch of this? Shift what up? Right, so if I shift everything up, is that gonna work? Why not? So if I shift everything up equally, the harmonics are not going to have the same relation to one another. So this is kind of tricky because you have to take into account both the harmonic and more challenging, you have to take into account the phase. So actually, people were trying for a long time to change, to like look mostly at the magnitude, change the magnitude so that the relations between harmonics were preserved. But the differences in the phase, or like the phase correlations were not preserved, and it made people sound really weird. Um, I mean, this, it still sounds weird, but it's a lot better than it used to be. So, um, so for example, if you wanted to slow this music down, what do you think you would do? Stretch out in time. But if I have a time signal, if I've sampled my music, so I have, let's say I have a thousand samples, and I want to stretch it out, and I play those samples so that they last two seconds instead of one second it's going to change the pitch, right? It's, it, turn, it gets a lot lower pitched. So in order to slow down music, you actually have to interpolate. You have to do some signal processing on those spaced out samples in order to get the pitch to stay the same. And similarly, when you change the pitch, you have to keep the, the relation between both the amplitude and the phase, um, as, as I mentioned earlier. And so uh, we have like 30 seconds left, so I'll show you another cool example of what you can do with phase vocoder. Also, just to be clear, Auto-Tune uses the phase vocoder. They're not the same thing, right? Auto-Tune is an algorithm that incorporates a very good phase vocoder. So this is a guy giving a speech in something, I don't know. And then they modulate it onto a Mozart uh, piece of music. I forget which. Lacrimosa. So this is pretty cool, right? <laughs> it's kind of amazing that you can actually do this with speech signals, which are tremendously complex, right? It's not like a violin where you can kind of see the the fundamental frequency and then the harmonics. Speech has a lot more going on in it. So, uh, yeah, that's all. Have a good weekend.